Welcome back to Murder Under the Midnight Sun. Thanks for tuning in. Now, as I've previously mentioned, I have a promotion going with Blue Apron, where if you sign up, you can get $30 off your first order. So if you've been wanting to give them a try, now's the perfect time. I also have a new promotion going that I'm very excited about because I'm a huge book junkie. If you use my link and sign up with Audible, you're going to get two free books and no commitment. So you're supporting the show for free and you're getting two free books, so there's no downside. I personally love listening to true crime books on audio while I do my daily chores. It's just like a podcast, but a little longer. And if you need recommendations, I will happily give you some. And as usual, this show is brought to you by my lovely patrons. Thank you to Molly, who just upped her pledge. You're my new favorite. Patrons get a variety of perks, including the option of selecting a case that I'll cover for a future Patreon episode, uh, current Patreon episodes that are already available. You're going to get some free goodies in the mail from me, a deep discount at the Threadless store, and if you sign up by October 15th, you're also going to get a Halloween goodie box. It is my favorite holiday, so I'm going to be spreading the love. Unfortunately, this year I'm going to be spending my favorite month recovering from surgery. I mentioned this on Facebook. I'm getting double carpal tunnel release surgeries starting October 1st. So I'm going to try to have a bunch of episodes stockpiled, but they may get uh, even more erratic than usual. So sorry, sorry ahead of time, but I got a lot of fun stuff in the works right now, including some historical cases and some more history. Yay! And last thing before we hop into the show, uh, as I've previously mentioned, I'm going to be sharing some other podcast trailers at the top of the show. So if you want to get in on that, just send me an email. And this week I'm sharing a trailer for one of my favorite podcast people's true crime podcast. It's called True Crime Island. And if you haven't listened, you definitely should. Cambo is one of the best guys out there, and he's got the best righteous anger in the game. When when do you get mad when listening to true crime? Well, so do I. If you want a weekly true crime podcast that says what you're thinking, then grab a beer and pull up a deck chair. This is Cambo from True Crime Island, another true crime podcast, and maintain the rage with me. Visit truecrimeisland.com where you can download or stream each episode, plus there's links to iTunes and social media. And as I always say, don't forget to delete your browser history. This is True Crime Island. Now, first up, we've got a local story, which actually ties in perfectly to the whole deleting the browser history thing. So this is a recent story, still developing, but I'm just giving you guys a little overview, and then I'll keep you updated as it goes to trial. So it looks like Alaska might have our very own Casey Anthony, or possibly a budding Mary Beth Tenning. 23-year-old... Stephanie LaFountain of Fairbanks was arrested on August 30th in connection with the deaths of her children. In September 2015, her four-month-old daughter passed away after she reportedly found her not breathing, but at the time it was not deemed a suspicious death, so it never went further investigation-wise. Then in November of 2017, her second daughter, who was just over a year old, was rushed to hospital after Stephanie said she found the child not breathing. The child ended up being airlifted to a hospital in Anchorage and passed away a few days later. This time around, when local police looked into the child's death and learned about her first daughter's extremely similar death, they launched a full-scale investigation. Stephanie's computer and phone search history were looked at, and some very disturbing things were found. 
about an hour before she had called 911 to report the emergency, she had Googled the following search terms, ways to kill human with no proof, ways to suffocate, and of course, how to commit the perfect murder. She also spent some of this time texting and calling other people. So she was arrested August 30th and arraigned the next day. And according to court documents, back when her first daughter passed away in September 2015, she had reported that she laid her daughter down for a nap at 4.20 p.m. and when she checked on her five minutes later, found her unresponsive. But her phone records show that starting around the time that she allegedly found her daughter unresponsive, she was actually texting and calling friends, boyfriend, etc. She didn't make any emergency calls until 5.01 p.m. when she finally called 911. When she did talk to 911, she didn't request an ambulance or help. She just told them that her daughter was dead. They did send an ambulance and found that her mother had rushed over to her house and was performing CPR on the child. The child was pronounced DOA at the hospital. Her second child's death was very similar. At the time, she was actually married to a soldier stationed at Fort Wainwright who was deployed overseas. At around 6 p.m. on November 20th, she attempted to call her husband overseas. She did not reach him. After that, she called her husband's family and told them her daughter wasn't breathing. They asked if she had called 911 and she said no. They told her to do so and rushed over to her house. Her father-in-law began performing CPR on his grandchild, who was still alive at the time. The child was taken to hospital in Fairbanks, then airlifted to Providence in Anchorage. Stephanie's husband had to take emergency leave and flew back to Alaska as soon as he could. He got to the hospital on November 24th. And within just a few hours, Stephanie left the hospital and flew back to Fairbanks, saying she was going to move out of their residence. Her daughter was still alive at this time, but she was declared dead later that evening. Since the family was living on Fort Wainwright military base at the time, the death was initially investigated by military police. Stephanie told them that she had found her daughter not breathing, so she brought her downstairs and tried tickling her to get her to respond. Of course, she didn't respond, and you know what happened after that. During the investigation, it was found that her first daughter's cause of death had been listed as undetermined, but is consistent with suffocation. Her second daughter's cause of death was anoxia, or a lack of oxygen to the brain. It was also found that both girls had been completely healthy their whole lives, with no history of illness or anything else that could have possibly led to their deaths. Stephanie has been charged with first and second degree murder. Her bail was set at $2 million, which is unprecedented. Uh, she's actually considered a flight risk, which is why it's so high. At a hearing on September 5th, she entered a not guilty plea and her public defender requested that her name reflect her maiden name because she's since been divorced. Her trial is currently set for October 15th, but it's likely to be moved back. And like I said, I will keep you updated as that case moves forward. Now is tonight's main story, the murder of Glenn Godfrey Sr. Glenn Godfrey was born in 1949 in Kodiak, Alaska. Kodiak is one of many communities located on Kodiak Island, which is the second largest island in the United States at about 3,600 square miles or 9,300 square kilometers. The island is around 300 miles southwest of Anchorage in an archipelago of several islands. The island was the ancestral home of the Aleutic people until the Russians came over in the 1700s and began harvesting natural resources, killing off scores of animals, and enslaving the local inhabitants. The island became home to the first permanent Russian settlement in Alaska. During this time frame, Captain Cook also explored the island and wrote about it in his exploration journals. For a time, the town of Kodiak was the capital of Russian America, which encompassed several different places in Alaska and eventually was geographically stretched as far south as a settlement in Northern California. 
After over a century of dominance, Russia decided to sell Alaska to the United States in 1867. Secretary of State William Seward facilitated the purchase for $7.2 million, approximately two cents an acre. At the time, it was known as Seward's Folly, as many found it to be a stupid idea. Presumably, they stopped laughing a few decades later when vast amounts of gold were discovered in then their hills. <laughs> And we will go more into the whole gold rush thing in a very soon in the future episode. When Glenn was born in 1949, Alaska was still 10 years out from becoming an official state, and the town of Kodiak had only just incorporated nine years prior. The town had a population of just around 1,500 people and was then and is now a hub of commercial fishing. Glenn attended school at Kodiak High, where he met his future wife, Patricia Gogol, whom he married not long after graduating in 1967. He was an ambitious young man with the goal of becoming an Alaska State Trooper, and he enrolled at the academy in 1970. As a trooper, he was stationed in a variety of locations across Alaska. His hard work and good attitude helped him rise quickly in the ranks, and by 1981, he was a lieutenant. A few years later, the family moved to the Anchorage area, eventually settling in a small community about 10 miles away called Eagle River. His ambitious rise in the ranks of the troopers continued, and in 1995, he was made the director of the Alaska State Troopers. As a member of the Aleutic, he was the first Alaska native to hold the position. Five years later, the governor made him the commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. And during his many years of hard work and public service, he and his wife had made a large family with two sons and two daughters. And by the time he retired from the Department of Public Safety in 2002, all of his children had married and had kids, and he had a total of 13 grandchildren. So after a lot of years of hard work and serving the public, at the age of 53, he decided that he wanted to retire from that position, and he was gonna be taking on a position as an executive at Koniak Incorporated, which is a Alaska Native corporation. He also wanted more time to spend with his family and especially his wife. They were planning a trip to Switzerland in August of 2002 to celebrate retirement and 35 years of marriage. And on the surface, it appeared as though he and his wife had the perfect life, but appearances can be quite deceiving. During his many years working for the troopers, Glenn had spent large chunks of time away from his family, which began to put a strain on his marriage. During the last few years, he was spending a lot of time working in Juneau. One day while he was out of town, his wife Patty came home to find that the house appeared to have been broken into but nothing appeared to have been stolen, but creepily enough, she found a copy of the Stephen King book, Misery, sitting out on a shelf. She knew that they didn't own the book and it appeared that someone had left it as some sort of message. She of course freaked out and left the house. As she walked down the road, she noticed that a car appeared to be following her. She tried to evade it, but it was persistent in following her until she finally ran back to her home which no longer felt like the sanctuary that it once had. She called Glenn to tell him what happened, but he seemed far less concerned than she would have expected. He insinuated that she had possibly imagined the whole incident or was being paranoid. He basically gaslighted her. She couldn't understand what had happened to the man she married. His high-ranking position and time spent working in Juno seemed to have changed him for the worse. Juneau is probably the least centrally located of all state capitals, and while it is connected to the mainland Alaska, it's inaccessible by road due to surrounding mountains. It's 850 miles southeast of Anchorage and is actually bordered on the east by British Columbia, Canada. Nevertheless, the tiny city with a population of 32,000 is the political hub of the state and a major tourist destination. It's one of the main stops for cruise ships, and in the summer months, thousands of tourists a day will flood into the city. 
And it also happens to be the second largest city in the U.S. by area at about 2,700 square miles or 7,000 square kilometers. It may not surprise you that the top four are all in Alaska. And the French looking word of Juneau may seem like a weird name for an Alaskan city, but it was actually named after a prospector from Quebec who founded the city during the gold rush. Juneau became the capital of the Alaskan Territory in the early 1900s, and thanks in part to gold mining, it became the biggest city in the territory until the mid-50s. Nowadays, a large proportion of the residents work in government in some way. There are both state and federal offices located there, and it's not hard to see how someone who spent a lot of time working there with other government people could start to become sort of emotionally distant from their wife who's living hundreds of miles away. One day when Glenn was on his way back home for a break, Patty heard a message on the home answering machine. It was ostensibly for Glenn, though Patty would later say that she felt it had been left for her to hear. It was from a woman who said that she missed him and loved him. It was from his mistress. When Glenn arrived home, Patty confronted him and he revealed everything. His mistress was a 33-year-old woman named Karen Brand. She was an ambitious young woman from Fairbanks who had graduated with a degree in finance from UAF. She then spent many years working as a legislative aide before becoming the vice president of the Alaska Chamber of Commerce. She was in charge of running the Anchorage office. She had also been married since 1996 to a man named Greg Helms, who, like Godfrey, was 20 years older than her. Once Glenn fully realized the heartbreak that he had caused his wife, he immediately told her he didn't want to lose her. He said he would immediately cut things off with Karen, and true to his word, when he next saw her, he told her that it was over. Initially, she appeared to accept this, but it was truly far from over. To everyone that knew her, Karen was considered to be very emotionally stable. But whether she'd always had a dark side or if this incident was what pushed her over the edge, her reaction to the breakup was a little reminiscent of fatal attraction. She began calling Patty and taunting her with sordid details of the year-long affair. Glenn had been spending much more time at home so it seemed when she couldn't physically get at him, she did the next best thing and went for his wife, Patty. She ended up turning off the answering machine and barely answering the phone after a while. It was also later found out that Karen had shown up in the Godfrey's neighborhood, pretending to be looking for a missing dog. She knocked on the doors of their neighbors and asked to search in their yards for her dog. In reality, she was trying to stake out his house. And not long after she began tormenting them, Glenn noticed that the key to his gun cabinet was missing. He searched the entire house, but it was nowhere to be found. He was unnerved, but just chalked it up to absent-mindedness. And for a man who had spent much of his life armed, it felt very strange to not have a gun accessible. On Friday, August 2nd, 2002, Karen showed up at the Godfrey's front door, pleading with Glenn to speak with her. Glenn was freaked out, but thinking on his feet, he told her that his father-in-law was feeling sick and they were actually just about to rush him to the hospital. He promised to speak with her later and she agreed and left. In reality though, he and Patty were spending that day in Seward fishing with family and just didn't want Karen to try and intrude. It had been the most stressful period in the couple's marriage, and they desperately needed time to relax together without threat of Karen ruining it. They drove to Seward and spent the whole day there. They had a fantastic time and ended up driving back pretty late in the evening, arriving home around midnight. When they walked in the house, Patty could see that there was a light flashing on the answering machine indicating a couple of messages. This was extremely disconcerting since the machine had been off. Sure enough, there were rambling messages from Karen that revealed her disintegrating mental health. 
One message was obviously meant to make it seem as though the affair was still ongoing, telling Glenn that Patty needed to know the truth, and then she also just pleaded with Glenn to love her. The couple was extremely rattled, and Glenn told her to stay put. He was going to check the rest of the house and make sure it was secure. Their house was extremely large, so he went off searching through the rest of it while Patty tried to relax. A few minutes later, Patty heard several gunshots from downstairs. She panicked and just didn't know what to do. But before she could even move, Karen came walking up the stairs, pointing a gun at her. Chillingly, she told Patty, I'll see you in hell, before she fired multiple shots at her from just a few feet away. Patty slumped to the ground, having been hit in the arm, leg, chest, and stomach. As she lay there in a growing pool of blood, Karen must have thought she was as good as dead because she walked back downstairs. Patty wasn't dead, but she was in dire circumstances. She was able to find a phone and call 911. The 911 call lasted for 49 minutes. I'm not sure if the police and ambulance were coming from Anchorage, but even if they were, it doesn't take anywhere near that long to drive to Eagle River. Eagle River. In fact, the dispatcher had completely fucked up by sending law enforcement on a wild goose chase. There was some sort of glitch in the database, and rather than listening when Patty repeatedly stated her home address, the police spent a very long time looking for an address that didn't even exist. The dispatcher also never asked for directions to the house or even a description. This error nearly cost Patty her life and would end up costing the municipality of Anchorage quite a bit. So for 49 minutes, Patty begged the 911 operator to send someone to her, stating that she was bleeding to death and was going to die any minute. This whole time, she also had no idea if her husband was alive downstairs or not. She told the operator that she couldn't lose him like this. He couldn't die without knowing that she forgave him. She also prayed quite a bit. Her faith was just intrinsic in keeping her going. But she also just seems to be an inherently strong person. During the call, while losing lots of blood and nearly losing consciousness, she was able to give precise details about her attacker. She knew how old Karen was and what her job was. She described her pretty perfectly down to height and weight. She had a pretty good idea of how many times she'd been shot. And while telling the operator all of this, another shot could be heard. And Patty stated that she believed Karen had likely just killed herself. Finally, after a grueling wait, law enforcement and an ambulance arrived and she was rushed to the hospital. The police found two bodies downstairs. Glenn had been shot three times, including in the head. It was determined that he had likely died instantly. Karen had, in fact, taken her own life by shooting herself in the head. It was truly a miracle that Patty survived. It was later found that the 44 caliber gun she'd been shot with was loaded with hollow point bullets, which are designed to expand upon impact and inflict maximum tissue damage. And despite being shot at close range, no major organs had been hit. The injuries she experienced were a ruptured eardrum, a shattered arm bone, the same arm being nearly severed from her body, a severed colon, and various lesser injuries. She ended up going through multiple surgeries for her various injuries, but made a full recovery physically. Emotionally, she was obviously incredibly distraught, having lost her husband with no warning, just when it seemed as they were on the verge of mending their relationship. She also was extremely unhappy with the various aspects of the police response and investigation. She filed a complaint with the Office of Victims' Rights. The law which created the Office of Victims' Rights had actually just gone into effect almost exactly a month before the shootings. The OBR had been created to, quote, help victims of crime obtain the rights they've been given under the Alaska Constitution and statutes in regards to their contacts with criminal justice agencies in the state. The OBR did a full investigation regarding the 911 call and aftermath and found that Patty's rights had been violated in a few different ways. Firstly, her right to immediate medical assistance had obviously been violated. They determined that this had been caused by an inadequate dispatch system 
and an inadequate dispatcher. They had not corrected the error of the wrong address once it became apparent that there was a problem. Patty is heard stating her correct address three times during the phone call and the dispatcher just pushed on towards the wrong address. And for some unknown reason, hard to say if it was stubbornness or stupidity or both. In fact, Patty may have actually ended up dying because of his error and it's only really due to complete chance that the police were finally able to find her house. An off-duty detective happened to hear sirens in his neighborhood, and he had just called dispatch to find out what was going on. He then found the police officers and guided them to the Godfrey's house. Patty had also repeatedly given basic directions to her house using landmarks, which the dispatcher also ignored. She had also given her daughter's phone number, begging the dispatcher to have someone call her daughter for directions, and this never happened. The police response as to why this never happened was that it's not in their policy to give death notifications over the phone, so they chose not to call the Godfrey's daughter. Yeah, that's a real good answer. According to the report created by the Office of Victims Rights, when 21 police officers later created written reports on the incident, very few of them actually listed the correct address. Most listed the non-existent address they had been searching for for nearly an hour. Patty's rights were violated again a few weeks after the shooting. The Anchorage Police Department held a press conference about the incident and the 911 response, and they released a transcript of the 911 call to the media. They violated the rights of Patty and her daughter, Valerie, by failing to redact personal information from the transcript including home address and telephone numbers. The APD could not give an explanation as to why this happened. Also during the course of the investigation, it was found that this incident was not the only one in which a glitch in the system caused officers to go to the wrong location, but it was the first life or death situation. So of course, after this happened, they completely revamped the 911 system, right? Nope, not at all. 16 years later, there are still arguments about the system. Just this year, the governor requested money to overhaul it, but was denied because they wanted that money to go find some more oil. As Alaska becomes more overrun by crime, the need for a better 911 system has never been more pressing, but I guess it'll just sort itself out eventually, right? Patty ended up filing a civil lawsuit against the municipality of Anchorage, which they settled for $700,000 in 2004. In 1999, Glenn had received the Citizen of the Year Award from the Alaska Native Federation, and after his death, they named an award in his honor called the Glenn Godfrey Law Enforcement Award, and it recognizes an Alaska Native law enforcement officer, federal, state, or local, who has shown outstanding dedication to the safety of the public in any location within Alaska, often requiring heroic courage in the face of danger. So that is just incredible. It really shows just how many lives he really touched. Glenn's son, Jared, has followed in his father's footsteps and has devoted many years of his life to public service. In 2015, Governor Walker appointed him to his cabinet as Senior Advisor of Rural Business and Intergovernmental Affairs. That is a word, supposedly. Since 2002, he has also served on the Alaska Violent Crimes Compensation Board as the chairman, which is another governor-appointed role. Thank you for listening to this episode, per usual. And if you're a new listener, welcome, and I hope you'll stick around. All right, guys, talk to you sometime in the future. Bye.
It's all I can do just to hold on to me. It's a stranger.